Yep, okay. Okay, that's fine. Right, I can hear you. It was Councillor uh, Govind and whom? Graham. Melise. Okay, I can hear you fine. Anybody else online? Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, it's uh, Peter, uh, Peter Bedford. You're online, are you? Hello, is that Peter Bedford? Who else is on? It's everyone, everyone's online except for Patrick Robinson and Councillor Bond. So is Sarah, Sarah on? Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, fine, thank you very much. Um, the s same applies uh, to you, Sarah, when you come online. If you could put the video on so we can see you. Oh, no. oh, that's really good. Nice to see you, Sarah. Um, Max, are you there? Has Max come on? Max, I understand you're online. Is that super? Uh, super, uh, have you got the video on yours? I do. I, I, I was trying to see if I can see the work there. Uh, this is sorry, I'm not sure if I'm on. I haven't Yeah, OK. That's all right. If you could put your videos on, because we're coming up to half past. So I would like to to uh, start on time. Do I need to go through Nick, um, Ashley and Jackie? Nick's on. Okay. And Jackie's on. Okay. But you're not... Okay, hi, thanks. And, and Ashley? Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Right, um, what I'd like to do is to start the meeting. So could I formally welcome you all um, to today's meeting of the Local Pension Committee. The meeting's being broadcast live to the public. Due to the current situation, um, all other members of the committee are joining online. So can I please ask that all officers and members remember to turn their microphones on when speaking off when you've finished and to put your video on for those who are online. Um, we have got um, two councillors, that is Councillor Govind and Councillor Graham, um, who are on a telephone line. Could I, before we start, um, welcome um, Councillor Adam Clark, because that's, he is the um, new member of this committee. Um, so a, a warm welcome to you, Adam. Could I then move on to the first item, which is... Um, the minutes. Could I, um, under, do I understand that we have agreement of the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of February 2020? If not, could you just indicate that you, there's a problem with it? Otherwise, I take it that the minutes are agreed. Uh, okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, on question time, we've received no questions from the public. There have been no questions received either under the uh, agenda item three by members understanding orders seven and seven three seven five. No urgent items have been um, given to me um, under, un, under four. 
So could I ask uh, members, um, do you have any declarations in respect of items on the agenda? No. 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 Okay, thank you. Before we move on to consider the substantive items on the agenda, could I, as a reminder, ask members to allow officers to present their full report before seeking to ask questions? As we're all joining online to ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak, I propose once the officers have finished presenting the item, I'll then open up for questions. To indicate that you have a question, please use the instant message function and I'll Just call you testing the audio one at a time. OK, to be sure everybody has. General. Sorry. OK, um, to be sure everybody has their say, um, I'll be calling on members asking if you've got any further things to add. So now I'm moving on to uh, on your agenda. Um, to agenda item six, which is the LGIM market update. Um, and it's the first of the substantive items today, and we're joined by James Sparshot, Claire Payne, and John Rowe from Legal and General Investment Managers, who will present their market update. This is included as part of your agenda pack, pages 12 to 32, and will also be presented on screen. So I then um, leave the floor to you, John. I think you're the one who's starting off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just get it on screen so I can... I need to get the page numbers right, don't I, so they match up with uh, what is on your version. James, are you able to get the presentation on screen? Uh, yeah, present... Uh, no? Uh, OK. All right, well, I'm going to start at the beginning. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so the way I've, the way I've, I've done this is uh, I'm going to run through how we think about the year to date very, very quickly and where we are now. Um, so if you, if you turn to the, the first slide, so the one I can see on screen, it hasn't moved yet. James, Sparshot, are you able to control the slides? James? Uh, okay, they're not appearing on my screen, so I just am trying to uh, work out how to. Sorry about this. I, I'm not a, I'm not an avid Skype user, so uh, there's so many of these different types of technology. But I, James, are you able to get control of the slides? Barshop? James, are you there? Maybe maybe Cat can just move them on. I'm yeah, if, that, if that's okay, I'm sorry. It's just that we, we we use different technologies, and it it all gets a bit much for me. I'm 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 not brilliant on uh, on technology. Okay, so um, if you look at the first slide, we really think about the year to date in four parts. There was the pre uh, mid February period where COVID nineteen was really seen as a localized China problem, and we had quite a normal pattern of investment returns. Then we had this period where a global spread was anticipated and there was a repricing of equities, but it wasn't panic. We had very normal asset behavior. So we had bond yields falling, bond prices going up, and we had equities falling, and we had credit spread gradually widening. And that was kind of pretty much if you said you get a shock to the financial system, what would you expect assets to do? That was very much in line with what you would expect given the shock. Then we had this period that that, that was from early March until late March, which was really something very different. And being a fund manager and being at the center of the crisis and seeing the asset price movements, the asset price movement suddenly became extremely unpredictable. So bonds, bond yields suddenly went up, whereas you would expect them to be going down in a crisis. There was clearly a lot of forced selling going on in the market, a lot of panic selling, and that that period was genuinely frightening. Um, it was frightening because there was a genuine risk to the financial system during that period. It had stopped being about COVID-19 and it had started being about forced selling of investors, particularly leveraged investors, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a, genuine, a genuine threat to the financial system. 
um, which ended uh, with the action, particularly from the Fed, but also from uh, other central banks at the end of March. But I honestly believe that if it had been allowed to go on for one week longer, the escalation in tension in the financial system could have been irretrievable. It was as bad. It was as bad as uh, anything since 0809 and the Lehman's collapse. And it, it was a period where you could really see things could get out of control. Um, so, so that was kind of Act Three of this year, and that that period felt very, very different from everything before it. And, and everything after it. Um, and then since then, we've had this, this kind of recovery, which has been off the back of asset prices having been be beaten up a lot already, a huge amount of policy response uh, from central banks and governments, uh, and also some better news on the virus itself. So probably the, the better news has been that we're getting more comfortable that the infection rate can be controlled by largely um quite limited measures right so a lot of people are working from home but we are seeing more people go back to work in Ch china and germany and places like that where actually they opened up more earlier they haven't seen many more outbreaks and when they have seen outbreaks in china korea germany they've been able to control those using what we call surgical strikes so very very targeted which have a big impact but only on a very limited number of people and therefore don't have a big economic impact. So that's kind of that good news on the on the virus uh, has probably been uh, uh, one of the factors that's led to the equity market recovery as well. So that's really how this is, a, for me, a very good visualization of really the four different acts of the year so far. And for anyone who's interested, our Elgin blog has a, a blog by Martin Beats, who's at the bottom there, that goes through those four acts in a bit more detail. Um, so then we, we get on to asset price movements themselves on the next slide. So uh, the, the, the one with the, the, uh, yeah, the, the next slide. And we've got the drawdown period and the recovery period. So the drawdown period on the x-axis is saying how much assets fell up to the 23rd of March. And then the y-axis, the vertical axis, is saying how much they recovered. And so it's been a very well-behaved recovery. Things that sold off the most have recovered the most. And effectively, we've just seen a big swing back to kind of mid single digit losses year to date. So if you had a diversified portfolio uh, year to date, then your investment return now is probably somewhere between uh, zero and minus five. Those kinds of numbers uh, is what you'd see in a, a cross asset diversified portfolio at, at, at this stage. Moving on to the, the equity market and where we see things going kind of going from here. So to the the earnings fall that we're going to see is looks like it's going to be around 25 percent. So 25 percent lower earnings for companies in 2020 versus 2019. But markets are clearly looking through that and, and relying on uh, a fast recovery in 2021, uh, supported by this extremely loose monetary and fiscal policy stance. There is a second scenario, which we, our kind of central outcome is probably between the two scenarios of what's currently being priced, which is a, a kind of 20, 25 percent earnings drop and a sharp rebound, and a second scenario where there is a bigger earnings hit and a slower recovery. Now, the big determinant between which of those two scenarios we witnessed is really the amount of economic scarring that comes from COVID-19. So it's not about COVID-19 itself, it's about the spillover that that has in business hiring decisions on consumer confidence over the next six to 12 months. So if everyone goes back to spending and if companies anticipate everyone will go back to spending, you get very limited amounts of economic scarring. Whereas if companies are worried about will people spend, they cut labour, and when they cut labour, they undermine consumer confidence, and then people do spend less, and then earnings fall. So that's kind of the, the, the way that I would I would think about it. Um, I don't don't know where that noise is coming from, but um, so that's the way I would think about it. It's it's all down to the amount of economic scarring uh, from here. Um, it's also worth noting on the graph on the right hand side how much better US equities have done than other markets. 
in a large part, that's a reflection of the very large technology weight in the S&P. So technology stocks, as you know, have done extremely well uh, as a result of the shift to greater use of technology, which people don't expect to be reversed. Uh, and off the back of that, the S&P has outperformed a lot versus other regions. So when, when people talk about equities, they often talk about the S&P because it's the biggest equity market. But actually, if you want to think about how much of the impact of COVID-19 has, has been priced back out, you really need to think about other regions because the S&P has had a regional benefit because it's this technology heavy um, uh, 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 index. So when you look at, say, the FTSE or the MSCI Emerging Markets, which you've also got here, they've recovered just over kind of uh, around two thirds a half to two thirds of their of their losses rather than anything more. Um, we're, we're basically going on to the next slide. So this is now the slide with bond yields on it. Um, we're, we're could you able to, sorry, could you able to uh, uh, put the page number or anything like that? Because I'm looking at my other laptop, but uh, not following the slides. Um, so there's a slide that's, uh, that says at the top, could we see the end of the 40 year bond bull market. So it's slide 19, I think. 19. Yeah. So slide yeah, 19. So we, we, we've seen a 30-year period where bond yields have been in structural decline. Um, that's, that's clearly bad news for asset owners going forward. It's been good news for them in the past because if they owned bonds, those have gone up a lot in value. Uh, it's bad news for pension schemes, of course, because it's meant the the, um, the cost of providing the liabilities, has, uh, uh, of meeting the liabilities has gone up a lot. Uh, and we're at basically now zero interest rates pretty much everywhere. Now, in terms of that reversing, structurally, I would say that's unlikely to reverse. And the reason for that being that a lot of the forces that have led us to zero interest rates are still in place. There's been no real effort globally to deal with excess debt, um, there's been no real effort to deal with a, to, to, to deal to find other tools to deal with crises. And so what we've seen in each crisis over the last kind of 30 years is bond yields falling and then never quite getting back to where they were before before we get the next crisis. Um, so unfortunately, I think this kind of very low interest rate environment is 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 here to stay, uh, which will make it more difficult for people to earn the returns they need to earn, uh, whether that's as individuals or as institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, and other asset owners. Because with yields already so low, it's hard to replicate the, the very positive returns we've seen over the last decade, for example. Um, on slide 20, uh, we've already seen a large retracement in credit spreads, which are clearly a very important variable for pension funds and very important asset class, in particular US investment grade, which is the dark blue uh, on the graph, their credit spread shot up to 350 basis points, so three and a half percent from just one percent coming into the year. But that's already retraced all the way down to about 140, 150, so 1.4, 1.5 percent. So nearly all of the moving credit spreads has already reversed. Um, which kind of tells you that there isn't that much further uh, for asset prices, particularly credit, for example, to, to run, because nearly everything that got priced in for the crisis has been priced back out just two months later. And then finally, uh, on slide 21, uh, our three scenarios. So I've talked a bit about the, the first two scenarios already. The first scenario is a kind of V-shaped recovery uh, quite a, a rapid rebound in consumer spending, a successful reopening of the U.S. economy without a second wave uh, of infections, uh, and uh, consumer and business behavior holding up okay. Now, that's still not like a super positive scenario. So to give you an example, um, U.S. unemployment was about 4% going, or in fact, it was below 4%. It was 3.5% going into 2020. Even in scenario one, U.S. unemployment will only be 8 to 10 percent at the end of this year. And at the end of next year, it'll be more like 5 to 6 percent. And then at the end of the following year, providing nothing goes wrong in that whole period, uh, it'll be back down to, say, 4.5, 4 percent. 
So you can see that even scenario one is not that positive. It's a perfectly credible scenario. Um, then you've got a kind of scenario two, which is some recovery, uh, but some scarring. And, that, and that's where you get more of a, a confidence impact. Um, companies reduce numbers of employees that undermines consumer confidence. And we have a kind of more prolonged, more traditional economic um, recession. What we've experienced here is a bit like a, it's like a flash recession, right? We've had it. And then if things recover quite quickly, it'll feel like a very short recession. Whereas scenario two is more like a normal recession that kind of goes on and takes longer uh, for, to, to, to get a recovery. And then there is a scarier scenario where we get a more persistent um, slump, where it proves to be harder to control the virus than anticipated. And that is a, a much deeper, darker, more horrible place, uh, more akin to the Great Recession. So that, uh, uh, as in kind of the, the late 1920s. So that is that is a credible scenario as well, but, but less likely. Um, now, in terms of uh, summary of views and, and the, the next steps, probably the last thing that I'd focus on in the time I have is um, the situation in America, because that's probably the most important here. Economic activity in America is rebounding really well, even with at-risk groups. So at-risk groups include those with asthma, older people, those who've had cancer. And what we're seeing is actually older people in America are going out, they are going to church, they are, they are spending, uh, and in doing so, that suggests quite a rapid return to normal. But the flip side of that is that several states in America are now seeing quite rapid increases in cases. And it, it, it is very difficult to slow down the virus once it gets a grip without a full lockdown. And if America is forced to stick its hands up and a number of large states say, we're going to need to go into a six to eight week lockdown, that would take quite a hit to confidence and to consumer behavior. So that feels like the most imminent threat is this pick up in cases in places like Texas and Florida. Texas saw an 11% increase in hospitalizations a day or two ago, which is a, a very rapid kind of increase and really points to a curve that is um, leading to exponential rises in cases. In terms of how countries have dealt with the virus, um, European countries have generally done very well. So Germany, for example, and Italy and Spain have seen a very rapid decline in their number of new cases. Uh, the UK has done a somewhat less good job, to be honest. If you look at the figures and you rebase them all to when they uh, all started getting cases, the UK's rate of decline is less effective than our European partners. Um, and then finally, we have America, who have not really achieved any decline from their peak. They've been pretty much flatlining at 20,000 new cases a day uh, since the original problem in New York. So that kind of hopefully gives you a summary of, of, of outlook and thought. Very happy to take questions, obviously very excited uh, about my job uh, and could stay with you all day if you like. Thank you very much then, uh, James. Um, okay, members, has anybody, does somebody want to indicate if they want to an ask any questions? Chair, I have a question. Please ask. Uh, that's, this is Councillor God, because I can't see on the screen, so I'm going to ask a question. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Please ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Yeah. Since the impact uh, globally, China is the biggest market right now, and China is on a second wave. How would that affect our investment uh, to the China, uh, you know, the far countries? So China has seen um, some cases in Beijing, but the total number of cases associated with the cluster they found in Beijing was 150 in a country of over a billion people. So actually, what, what, what China is really seeing is it is seeing isolated outbreaks which are being dealt with in a very, very effective way by the Chinese government. To put that into perspective, there was recently an outbreak in a German slaughterhouse. I think it was a German slaughterhouse. And that resulted in 650 cases. So actually, the Chinese outbreak, the Beijing outbreak that's been in the news a lot, was very small. 
what wasn't small was a very large Chinese reaction to it. The Chinese reaction seems to be even a small cluster will get a big reaction because we do not want to let this get out of control again. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Okay, um, Chris, I understand you have a question. Yes, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the, the three scenarios you outlined, the, the kind of the middle one, you know, the 50% chance scenario to kind of some recovery, some scarring, I just wonder what, what you think that means for unemployment in the UK? in terms of kind of figures, because some of the figures I've seen in the press are, are, are kind of fairly large and fairly kind of rapid increases in unemployment. So, yes, in, in the UK, we, we came from a similar starting point to the US, which was we had kind of multi-decade low levels of unemployment going into uh, the crisis. And actually, um, Brexit, this is, a, this is a time when something, an area where Brexit can help because actually Brexit to a degree uh, reduces the supply of labour by reducing the, the, the access um, from the European market into the UK labour market. But you'd still be looking at kind of that, those kind of high single digit to 10% unemployment rate potentially. So very similar to the US. Um, the, 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 the how high, you'd be at the top end of that range going into this year. So we'd be, we'd be talking about something like 10% uh, unemployment and then not a rapid recovery in that unemployment in the following year. So they are very big numbers. Um, a lot of this is going to come down to what non-COVID impacted companies choose to do. So let's just take a random company. So if you're a, if, if you're a, a medium-sized company who's always worked a certain way, and all of a sudden you've embraced technology and you've realized that you don't need surveyors to go out to wherever. It can all be done remotely, and this saves 20% of the time, and therefore you need 20% less surveyors, say. Um, uh, and, 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 and it's how much of that kind of restructuring we see in the areas that are not um, directly impacted by COVID-19 that will be crucial to the outcome we see. Yeah, that's great. Could you, could you just, you know the 10% the figure you mentioned, in terms of millions, what, what, what is that? Uh, so that would be about, the UK labour force is something like 30, 30 odd million, one sec, 30 million, million 35, so it'd be about three and a half million uh, people unemployed. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I actually think a bigger, a bigger hidden threat in the specific case of the UK is that there were a lot of companies already who are unsure what the impact of the Brexit deal will be on their costs and on their supply chains. The combination of that and the COVID-19 shock runs the risk of accelerating the restructure of those supply chains. So it's an for me, it's an added area of just uncertainty at a time that the UK didn't need that uncertainty. Um, because if, if you're already teetering on the edge of do we stick with the current supply lines or do we change them and do we wait and do we not, this could just be enough to say, well, actually, we've got a six-month hiatus now anyway, so let's just crack on with the process. And I am, I am somewhat concerned that the combination of COVID-19 and the timing is just very unfortunate for people making making the investment decisions in the UK. Okay, um, Tom, you had a question. <coughs> yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine a worse scenario, really, but the only thing I would say is presumably you, we've got about 1,220 million invested, which is invested uh, over a period of time, uh, and the yields on that will not be as severely Im impacted as somebody investing now uh, because the market has recovered. But where I see the difficulty is going forward, trying to invest 
to get some sort of yield to be able to meet the liabilities of the pension fund. What what would your comment? I mean, you really can't do anything about that. We are where we are. The interest rates are virtually at zero, um, and yields are very very poor. Uh, is I, just, I personally can't see what you can do to uh, change that. Have you have you got any comment on that? Yeah, so, actually, so I, I do, and I have some positive comments and also a kind of tale of caution, if you like. So I think there will be a lot, of, a lot of fund managers in particular who will be coming up with ideas to try and solve these problems, and some of those might come with quite high costs and fees. And personally, I'd be very careful about, about complex ideas that claim to be silver bullets that come with high fees, because I think that is a... Uh, a recipe for, for problems. Um, where I think there's a, an opportunity is I, when I look at local government pension scheme asset allocations, I do think there are things that can be done. There are missing asset classes that can improve the risk adjusted return. And I've done this quite a lot. I've presented at the, um, uh, at the, the local government pension scheme investment uh, conference several years, and I looked at all the allocations for that. I've presented to Central as a group looking at the average asset allocation as well as the individual asset allocations of all of the schemes in there. And there are clearly asset classes missing, in particular alternative credit areas like emerging market debt and high yield, both of which right now are still quite beaten up after the, um, the problems this year. There's some of the particularly emerging market debt, for example, is one of the lagging asset classes. And I do think there are some areas that there are some new sleeves that can be added in at this time to at least give you a, a better shot on a risk adjusted return basis. So these are things that if you looked at any of the funds that I manage, they would all have these things in them. So this isn't me saying go and do something I'm not doing. This is exactly what we do. We go and we make sure there are no missing slices and then we try and spread the risk as much as possible so that in aggregate we have a better chance on a risk adjusted basis of, of meeting our goal. And actually I think in some of those areas adding in the missing bits is actually the easier win. And a lot of those, those new bits are not expensive. These are not, you know, emerging market debt is not a particularly expensive thing to invest in. Neither is um, uh, listed infrastructure, listed global real estate. And these are actually quite good diversifiers, in my opinion. Thank you. That, that sounds quite hopeful. Um, I, I let, let's hope uh, the world emerges from this uh, and things do bounce back quickly, but I, I fully understand the risk you're saying, and I, it's going to be a tough time, but that gives us quite a lot of hope. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, Peter Bedford, Peter, did you have a question? Over? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully you can hear and see me. Um, just, just regarding the table on page 21 for the global GDP impact, um, when I take from that, you know, that there is a a 90% probability of us, or global GDP, returning to pre-COVID levels within two years. Is that right? That's, that's how I'm reading that. And um, I wondered what the view was in terms of where the UK's position would sit, because I've read different analyses, you know, some of which say that it could take six to eight years to get back to pre-COVID levels. I just wondered what the view on where the UK was like. I know there's so many variables in this, but where the UK was perhaps on its trajectory to sit. So, so in, in isolation, yes, I think it's fair to say that it'd be more like three years under the um, under the scenario two. So it's it's by the end of kind of three years, I'd say there's a, a 90% likelihood we get back to previous levels of uh, of GDP. So that would be actually though that would be like losing globally. That would be like losing nine percent of gdp or something like that because that would be the real growth in gdp you would normally see over a three-year period so that that would still be quite a missing chunk but yes back to the level the uk the only thing that really makes the uk different um, from other countries is this combination of the uncertainty that comes from covid19 and uh, and brexit um Leaving to one side whether or not Brexit is a, is a good or bad thing, I think people on all sides of that would agree it's a period, in the short term, by which I mean one to five years, it is a period of uncertainty. And the last thing you need when you're going through a period of uncertainty is a second uh, uncertainty factor coming along at the same time. And so there are, are I would say that the, the range of, likely, of outcomes for the UK over the next, say, three years 
is tilted to the downside versus other countries. Longer term, it could be very different because we could enter trade deals that could offset that and could be a better outcome. But when you actually look at this period, if you were a large multinational that doesn't know what a trade deal is going to look like, thinks it has a 40% chance that there isn't going to be a trade deal, and you're forced to make investment decisions at a period of extreme flux and employment decisions under a period of extreme flux, wouldn't the commercially sensible thing to do be to target shutting down your UK operations? That's, that's, the, that's the thing that worries me, is logically, I can imagine myself in a boardroom ha having those discussions. That's what worries me. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Uh, Max. You had a question. Uh, Max, did you have a question? Sorry, I forgot again to press the uh, button. Um, yes, I had a couple of questions. The first was partially answered just now, um, but presumably if we uh, uh, settle up with the EU on a deal by the end of the year, that will remove a lot of the uncertainty that you've been talking about. Uh, but my second question, just to continue, was um, the quantitative easing which the Bank of England has just, just commenced on. Um, is that going to have a, a long-term effect on our... Um, strategy. So the so on the on the first point, yeah, if we do get a deal, so the odds that we put on on the being a deal by year ends around sixty percent of either a deal or a form of a hidden extension. So call it a deal, but with a long implementation period, something along those lines. It depends how comprehensive that deal is. One kind of deal would be um, no tariffs on goods. Uh, and services is, is different. Now, that would be very problematic for the UK as a deal because we mainly export services, um, but it would still be a deal. So it very much depends what the deal is as to how much uncertainty uh, it removes. Um, on the quantitative easing, yeah, I, it just provides a backstop for assets. So all else equal, it should it should make people just confident about about buying credit, but unfortunately also drags down interest rates. So every time they do QE, which helps the real economy, it hurts uh, insurance companies and pension schemes uh, who, are, who, who, who then struggle to, they find it more difficult to find the assets to actually service those, those liabilities unless they, already, uh, unless they already own them. So QE is good for some people, but unfortunately, in my opinion, not great for, for long-term institutional investors. Thanks. Okay, thank you, James. Um, I do have a question uh, myself out of curiosity. Um, Sorry, I'm well, just trying to make the technology work. I have a question, um, James, from uh, from me. Um, and that is on the um, outlook um, as we come out of this problem. Um, all the uh, countries' response at the moment in the States and over here um, has to be issuing um, debt or issuing money as though um, it, it, it's like water. Now, um, does that then mean that debt is being sidelined um, because the normal response, uh, the normal orthodox response to um, debt is at some stage it's got to be paid back. Therefore, you've got to tighten up the screws in order to do it, which is the opposite of what you want to do to get the economy. Or are you suggesting that one of the responses of coming out of it may be that um, economic uh, orthodoxy is not going to work and you're going to turn more to things like, and I'm not suggesting the uh, modern um, um, monetary theory is, is one you should follow, but um, is, is, let's say, the orthodox response um, not the one that's going to apply? So, yeah, it's a... It's, it's, yeah, that is the biggest question probably facing markets over the next five years. Um, so in some countries, it already doesn't apply. So if you look at Japanese uh, debt to GDP of, of the government side, at say 200, over 200%, and then you look at the proportion of 
of those bonds that are owned uh, by the, the, the Japanese central bank, it, it, there is no real expectation that money ever gets repaid. So we're already in a kind of slightly mythical world where you can issue debt, buy it back yourself, and everyone thinks that's okay. It, it's sort of a, it is a slightly bizarre situation, and it's very clear that the US and the UK are going down the same route. We're issuing debts that it is very questionable will ever be repaid. But it almost then becomes, what is it that causes markets to then sell assets? If I own bonds and the central bank says, well, you can sell them, but if you do, I'll buy them and you'll earn less because I've made interest rate zero. It's actually quite hard as a market to, to force economic orthodoxy on governments uh, if they have control of their own currency. Um, in Europe is where it will be different. Europe, even with the uh, European Recovery Fund, which is, is part of, a key part of their reaction to COVID-19, they're already talking about um, tech tax, carbon tax, and the ways that they will actually claw this money back. So in Europe, there is still very much a, an orthodoxy to the economic policy led by Germany and detested by Italy. Um, uh, in the US uh, and in, in the UK, I think you're right that we are we are entering a new normal where which looks nothing like uh, orthodox economic policy. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, Nick, um, sorry, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, with all this um, sort of quantitative easing, that US, UK, Europe, and a lot of the rest of the world are doing, does that mean that down the line, not immediately, but say two or three years time, perhaps five years time, eventually you're going to get a load of inflation and the governments effectively can't control that by raising interest rates because they can't afford that with their own debt. So they'll just let it ride. Is that what a, a, a scenario we're going to face? So that is that is a very credible scenario, and it's actually the one that everyone originally said would happen when QE was first introduced um, after the global financial crisis in kind of 09, 010, uh, 09, 10. Um, I think people, we all have to be quite humble on inflation. It hasn't picked up the way that people anticipated. And the idea that in the U.S., you could have three and a half percent unemployment, but still almost no um, price inflation was not something people anticipated. So I think inflation is an area where economists and market people have to be very humble and accept we don't really understand what, what has allowed that situation of such low unemployment with such little inflation. And if you don't understand that, it then gets very hard to be to have a strong view in the future. But what I would say, uh, which I think is, is kind of crucially your point, markets are being very sanguine about the risks of inflation. So markets outside the UK, because the UK inflation market is very distorted because of defined benefit pension schemes de-risking, and, and that, that causes excess demand, which pushes the price up artificially. But when you look at inflation markets outside of the UK, they are pricing very, very little in in the way of future inflation. Uh, and that does suggest that the risk you're talking about, markets are largely ignoring. And I do agree that that is a key risk to this kind of, the sustainability of this new way of printing money and buying bonds. But the take I have is that the standard response, which they did in the 80s, which is to raise interest rates, they can't do that because the public finances can't afford it. Yes, the, the question is, do we get the inflation? You can, you can explain why we should get the inflation, but the same argument has held for at least the last five years, and the inflation hasn't come through. So there's clearly something going on in the background that is deeply deflationary. And it could be the role of technology. Technology plays a deeply deflationary role. Um, it drives down the, the cost, the marginal cost of things, while driving up uh, kind of productivity. So if, if, you, if you take an example of free computer games on phones, those used, to, those used to cost money, and now people pay, play this stuff for free. It's a, very, it's a very banal and small example, but technology and the role it's played 
is maybe the deflationary force. The second one could be there are 6 billion people, over 6 billion, not 7 billion in the world. A lot of them earn a lot less than people in developed markets. And the reality is that it might be that they are a pressure relief valve that stops wages from rising in the way that you might anticipate because the worker doesn't have the pricing power that they did in a more closed economy to demand higher wages even when unemployment is low. So I agree with the sign. I agree it's entirely plausible, and I agree they can't respond to it in the way they have done historically. It'll be a very difficult outcome if it happens. It's, also, it's just very, very hard to say that we'll get inflation when we don't know why there hasn't been inflation. So I, I, I agree with it as a scenario. I'm just saying it's, it, it, it's hard to be confident we get inflation, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Right. Thank you all very much indeed. Now, I understand there, that, Claire, um, you're going to make a presentation. Uh, could I, because of uh, the amount of uh, presentations we've got and the time, um, could I ask you, Claire, if we could do it within five minutes, um, that would be most helpful uh, to members. So I pass over to you, Claire. Great, thank you. And I've had connection issues, so I hope you can hear me on the phone. And I think James is going to pull the slides forward. Um, yes, I will very briefly go through our stewardship to Elgin. Um, so if we look at slide 24, um, stewardship is the term we use to describe how we look after our clients' assets through our active ownership. Um, and we do this to, to protect and enhance your assets over time. Um, we have a responsibility not just to our clients, but also to the market and the broader society, and we generally do this in four ways. So we use our scale um, as, a, as a large investor to influence other investors, governments, regulators, and policy makers, as well as obviously companies. Um, ESG integration is something that is led from the top in the business, um, and that permeates throughout the business. Um, we build long-term trust with... Um, companies that we engage with um, so that we can have effective long-term relationships and this um, ensures that we have as much influence as possible. Um, we do that um, rather than sort of in the media, although we're not afraid to go public where necessary. Um, and we use our voting. Um, that's a really powerful tool that we can use to escalate concerns. So if engagement doesn't affect change, then um, we can use our significant scale through voting uh, with our one voice across our entire equity book to affect um, positive change. Um, so slide 25, um, to prioritize, prioritize our engagement, um, we identify key themes by assessing risks and opportunities from the top down. So you can see here that we identify demographics, technology, and energy that will actually impact all companies over the long term. And then you can see there, within these categories, there are material issues that we believe impact all companies across all sectors. So you can see diversity, for example, climate change, transparency. And this will also help to push market standards on some of these topics. Um, and it's about harnessing opportunity and not just actually identifying risk. So slide 26. Um, this is just an escalation chart that shows how we engage uh, with consequences. So we have an important role as an active owner, um, and our engagement is structured to affect change across the market. Um, it doesn't matter if we invest in companies through active or index funds. What matters is that they do well, um, and this is why we engage and vote using the assets in our entire equity portfolio. But to be an effective, engagement must have consequences. So we vote against companies when required, and we have the threat of investment from some of our funds um, as another means of sending a powerful message to companies. So um, here you can see direct engagement with companies that provides a powerful engine to incentivize companies to govern better and to manage their risks and opportunities, um, and that positively impacts our investments over the long term. Uh, collaboration is a really powerful tool that we use. Uh, we collaborate with like-minded investors and other stakeholders. Um, and it's fundamental to our, our process. This allows us to raise and share um, ESG concerns about specific companies, um, topics, um, and approaches with other investors, and, and that means we can um, obtain additional ESG information, um, and we can really make a powerful impact. 
And um, voting against, as I mentioned, is um, a really powerful tool that we use um, as an active and engaged investor. We take that really seriously and our responsibility to exercise the voting rights of our clients' assets. Um, vote decisions are based on Elgin's voting policies, they're custom policies, and they're undertaken by us, the investment stewardship team. Um, if you um, move to slide 27, um, you can see here our top engagement topics from 2019, very brief snapshot, um, and you can see at the bottom there the top themes that we engaged on, not a surprise, obviously, that climate change, diversity, and board composition comes up there. Um, slide um, 28, um, this is just a little deep dive into um, one of our key um, engagement um, topics, which is climate change. Um, and we do, we, we engage on climate change through regular engagement with companies, but the Climate Impact page is actually our flagship um, climate engagement program. It's focused on 80 of the world's largest companies in the six key sectors you can see there, oil, gas, mining, autos, utilities, food and financials. These sectors were selected because they, we believe they're pivotal to climate change and to a low carbon economy. Um, the companies in these sectors, uh, we assess them rigorously across um, various criteria, um, from their policies to their targets and their climate lobbying activities, for instance. Um, and then we engage with these companies. Uh, we give them homework. Um, we give them improvements um, that we would like to see over the next 12 months. Um, companies that step up and make improvements um, against our specific asks are named and famed um, publicly. Um, so we shout out that they have done a good job, um, while those that fall behind will be removed from the funds in our future World Fund range, um, but also will vote against the chair of those companies across all of our holdings. Um, so that's quite a powerful, a powerful signal. Um, the next slide, 29, is briefly on our future world protection list. So this is a set of exclusions uh, based on companies that fail to meet um, globally accepted principles of business. Um, or don't meet our minimum requirements on the carbon transition. So you can see there there's three main categories, coal companies, controversial weapons, and companies that um, um, you know, go against the UN global compact violation. So um, the list is designed to mitigate investment risks by removing exposure to the companies whose businesses are inherently risky um, and that, that we consider are unsustainable, such as coal mining. Um, those which are involved in activities that in, the, in most countries of the world um, are illegal, um, which is the controversial weapons, and then those businesses that consistently violate globally accept, accepted principles um, of sustainable and responsible business practice, which is the UN Global Compact list. Um, so the Future World um, Protection List is incorporated into our voting policies across all our votes, um, and, and that's a list that's updated every six months. Um, and we will vote against those companies that violate those three um, areas. Um, we'll vote against the chair of the board. Um, the companies on the Future World Protection List are also removed from the index construction of our Future World Fund range. This means that the shares and the bonds of the company are not bought at all. Um, so this approach, we believe, encourages companies that are on the list, uh, on the UN Global Compact List, um, to improve their practices and behavior. And then the final slide, I hope I'm still within time, is just a very brief overview of um, our achievements in 2019, um, where you can see our engagement um, activity, our voting activity. Um, we opposed um, the election of more than 4,000 directors in 2019 for various reasons. Um, and you can see there the, the regulation and the public policy consultations we've taken part in. So ultimately, being stewards of your assets, this is some of the activity we undertook um, on your behalf. I hope that's helpful. I know that was a very quick run through. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. That was very kind. Um, right. Uh, right. Uh, unless um, there's uh, anybody who's uh, on the phone, and that's Melise or Rachel. Um, yeah. I, in, I, I presume there aren't any questions. No, no, I, I'm, I'm happy, thank you. Okay, thank you very oh, much. Yeah, I'm happy, I'm also. Okay, um, Claire, could I thank you very much indeed, but could I thank also uh, James and John uh, for the presentations? Um, could I just say to you, um, you're uh, free to leave um, as you so wish.
But thank you very much Great, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity, Chair. Goodbye. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Chair. Goodbye. Okay, guys, um, the next item on the agenda is action taken by the Director of Corporate Resources, uh, LGPS Central Global Investment Grade Corporate Bond Fund, uh, and Declan is going to make that presentation. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, just a very quick update for the, for the committee. Um, one of the changes that we agreed to the asset allocation back in, in January from the sort of strategy refresh was a 3% allocation to corporate bonds, which we haven't had for a, quite a few years. Um, Central already had a, um, an offering that developed with other partner funds, which they actually launched in, in March with um, four other, other partner funds with about $1.2 billion of, of assets. So we, um, uh, as, as sort of part of the process, we got Hyman to perform a bit of due diligence, check the fit with the fit with the sort of the strategy that we've we've got at the moment. So the investment subcommittee did get some papers, and off the back of that, um, using sort of the director of corporate resources delegated authorities, we put 100 million pounds into the funding in April, and that came from a mixture of kind of cash that we we just had that sort of come up either in income or kind of the uh, the currency hedge, and also a, a sale of some of the index linked bond, which is where the, the strategy kind of outlined we should take it from. So. At the moment, we're sitting a little bit below the 3% allocation, but we'll, we'll top those up at, a, at an appropriate time, obviously, with the volatility at the moment. There's kind of quite a few calls on, on cash and other things. Um, so that's always it. was just a quick update for the committee. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Declan. Has anybody got any questions? Because otherwise, um, I would ask you to uh, note the report. But first of all, has anybody got a quick yeah. question to Declan? Chair, yeah, just a quick question. Page 30, question 6, surplus cash of uh, pension fund holding. Can you just uh, clarify that, uh, Declan, please? Okay, so the surplus cash there is on the on the Kames hedge, and what we what we have to do is Kames are sort of going out and buying sort of currency options, and we have to back those with sort of cash, you know, if they're... If, if the currency goes the wrong way and they have to sort of pay out of the option or to actually purchase the option in the first place. Sometimes the, as the currency moves the other way, we actually get better kind of a, a financial return back on that sort of that, that currency kind of, um, that currency is not, not so much a bet, but kind of a, that currency sort of uh, position that they've, they've taken. So quite often if the a sterling is kind of appreciating in value and kind of getting stronger often sort of cash comes back into the, the fund the sterling's going down we have to sort of pour cash into into games to, to meet our obligations so it just happened at this period of time sterling was going through a period of strengthening so it just meant that we had cash that at the time games didn't feel that we needed to to back out the options that they were placing thank you Joe. i'm happy now okay is everybody then uh, content to note the report? Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Declan. Um, the next is the LGPS Central Product Development and Performance Update, uh, and that's uh, bullish to introduce the item. Hello. Get just get grips, grips, grips with the, with the uh, tech. tech. So this is our standard LGPS central update for each quarter. We've tagged on to the back of this a uh, presentation from LGPS central delivered by Mark, which is Appendix A. So, oh, hold on a sec. Oh, so to the background, we've got um, LGPS Central coming in after this quick presentation here from myself. A bit of background, we've got four funds that we're invested with Central at the minute, which is the Global Active Equity Fund, the Emerging Active Fund, um, some private equity in 2018, and most recently, Declan just mentioned, the Corporate Bond Fund. Point five on the paper, moving on. What Central have got in the pipeline is uh, an emerging market bond fund, EMD for short. It's available. Um, we have currently got a holding with uh, Ashmore, which we will be looking to transfer pending due diligence. We'll bring a proposal back to subcommittee later in the year. Uh, 
Central have appointed managers. There are two, uh, Amundi Asset Management and uh, MNG. They completed the procurement earlier this quarter, so they'll be available soon. And we're one of a few partner funds who are looking to invest. Uh, there are two others. Next on the list for Central that we'll be interested in is uh, targeted return. We do currently have investment exposure via three managers, Aspect, Ruffer, and Picte. We will be reducing our allocation during the year accordingly based on the strategic asset allocation review we completed earlier this year. Uh, we have managed to keep this asset class because it does allow us active management and to take account of um, market movements which has been quite useful in the first three months of this year. That class generally hadn't lost as much as standard equity positions. I think that we were down um, between minus 10 on one manager and we're marginally up on aspects in the first three months. Uh, there, is only other there is only one other partner fund in interested with this product so we'd hope to be able to get to a resolution <coughs> sooner. Uh, next on the list that our fund will be interested in is multi-asset credit or MAC. It's a bit more complicated um, in terms of the amount of instruments it can invest in. So uh, point 0.15 on the paper notes we can invest in uh, investment grade bonds, high yield bonds, emerging market debt, loans, convertible bonds and so on. Uh, we do have some overlap obviously with EMD, with Ashmore currently. Um, so we'll be keen to make sure we don't over over by any particular side. So we will be looking at the mandate and the development of that mandate. We do currently have some exposure, uh, about half a percent of our fund. Um, and we will be going to circa 4% once uh, a suitable product is built. Uh, number 22 is a uh, direct property. Again, Central are developing a product there. We do currently have circa 400 million pounds worth of property or 10% of the fund's value invested in property um, via Colliers, LaSalle and Cames. The direct portion of that is uh, with Colliers and it's worth circa 97 million currently. Uh, we are talking to Central constantly regarding what a direct holding would look like. They have proposed and presented a business case to the investment working group um, which has now been approved and we'll be looking to progress that through the year. We're hoping to have something ready circa back end of this year, so quarter four of 2020. Uh, infrastructure is next on the list. It's a little bit behind property in terms of uh, delivery. Our fund does have a holding, circa 400 million. So infrastructure managed via IFM, KR, JP Morgan, Infra Capital, and Stafford. Um, the allocation is circa 10.4, which is a little over the target, but given the illiquid nature of pricing, we're, we're fairly comfortable with that supposed uh, slight overweight position. Central are building a product which gives us an option to weight how much money we put into one of their two sleeves. They've got something called um, a core sleeve, which is your standard infrastructure type products and something which is holding more opportunistic type products. Uh, we will be reviewing the investment case and again bring that back to committee later in the year. So that's, that's the last of the, the products that we're interested in at the minute. Um, we've got other matters which is uh, 30 and 31 on that paper so very quickly Gordon Ross who was the deputy CIO has become the CIO um, the current post holder is moving to another pension pool and the head of private markets position has not yet been filled. Central have had that one open for a while. Um, so we're hoping that can get, they can get somebody in soon so we can um, at least make a top-up private equity investment uh, when it becomes available. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, before I open it up for questions, um, I understand there may be a contribution then from, uh, a short contribution from uh, either and or Mark uh, Davis and Colin Pratt. So i just hand it over to you guys. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Loud yep. and clear. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's Colin here. I'd be glad to know you don't have a picture of me, which anybody who knows me will think that's a positive. Uh, 
but the, I know about half of the committee looking at the list, about half of you knew since I left Leicestershire two years ago to join LDPS Central. Uh, seems a long time probably to you and it seems a long time to me, but I did spend 32 years at Leicestershire, uh, so I know those of you that were on the committee quite well from that stage. Uh, I, before we start the presentation, and Mark will do the body of the presentation, I'd just like to do a brief introduction, starting with apologies. Uh, firstly, apologies that we can't be with you. Obviously, that's completely outside of our control, but we would much rather be presenting this in person than, uh, than down the phone line, effectively. Uh, and probably more importantly, an apology that the performance that we're about to present hasn't been better than, than it is. Uh, in terms of a recap of what we were asked to do at Central, uh, that was to build equity funds, one in global equities and one in uh, global emerging markets, that had a multi-manager approach, and that simply means there was more than one manager involved, uh, and to target performance that was outperformance that was quite challenging. So the Global Equity Fund has a challenging 1.5% per annum outperformance, uh, and the Emerging Markets has a 2% per annum outperformance. Both of those performance objectives are set over a five-year period, so there's recognition that performance, and particularly outperformance, won't come in a straight line. Uh, we're just over a year into uh, Global Equity and less than a year into Emerging Markets. And I'm not pretending that short-term performance doesn't matter because you know, I often say the long term is made up of lots of short terms. Uh, but uh, you know, we are relatively early into these days, but the performance so far hasn't been the standard we would expect. In the context of building the product, uh, in both cases we appointed three managers. Uh, however, there is a slightly different approach to them. In that within global equities, there are managers there with specific style biases. So we have a manager that has a bias towards value stocks, a manager that has a value to, a bias towards growth stocks, and one that will sort of be variable over time. Uh, whereas within emerging markets, there aren't really that managers that have style biases, and virtually every manager is, is what we call a stock picker. Uh, so their positions are based on the stocks that they find to be attractive. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that the managers don't have a small style bias. All managers have a style bias of some kind, but those style biases are not particularly large. Uh, so we have three managers in both, but a slightly different approach to it. Uh, so as I say, it's, it's a five-year performance objective, uh, and, and please bear that in mind. Short-term performance hasn't been great. Uh, I was involved in this set up of these funds, and by set up that means uh, the appointment of the managers and the set up of the structure, so the three manager structure. I am no longer involved in it. Uh, on a day to day basis, Mark and his team have the oversight function of the three managers. Uh, I have a role in terms of overseeing Mark uh, and his team, and I do take a hands on role, not officially, but unofficially. And the performance of this fund matters, and it matters to you as the investors in the fund, but it also matters to me because I feel personally responsible for the managers that have been appointed. Uh, with that, I'll hand on to Mark. Uh, he will introduce himself, uh, and he, he will also go, and go through the historic performance, and more importantly, why we think the historic performance is not uh, indicative of what, what we expect to achieve in the longer term. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, we're happy to answer any questions during the presentation, but with that, I'll hand on to Mark, if that's, that's okay. Great, thanks, Colin. Um, just to reiterate Colin's words, it's a shame I'm not there to meet you all in person, as it's the first time I um, obviously have presented to you, to you all. Um, I joined, a bit of background on me, I joined Central at the start. I previously worked for Derbyshire uh, Pension Fund. Um, I'm not sure if you know the staff there, but I worked with John Kinley and, and Neil Smith and a few others who went off to join a, a separate pool. I then got two Peter Cross to work in the active equities team at Central. And uh, during the life cycle, uh, as Colin mentions, the product has been passed over to myself and my team to, to look after and manage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, going forward. So if we start on, as Colin pointed out, uh, if we start on pay, uh, slide 43, that's just to give you a few highlights on the fund. Um, the three managers and their weightings, inception date, and how much uh, Leicestershire's uh, position was valued at the end of May. 
Um, as you can see, it's highlighting that that outperforms target is 1.5% per annum after costs. So in Q1, um, it, as uh, Colin pointed out, uh, performance in the Global Equity Fund was disappointing. Um, this in large part was driven by the big market corrections that we saw in March um, and the fact that one of our managers is uh, value orientated and the quarter saw um, growth performing strongly against, against value. So at the end of the quarter, we, the fund was 3.5% behind the benchmark, which if our performance target all came in a straight line, would, would imply that we were 5% behind the target. However, it is worth noting that I've included some earlier, uh, more recent performance numbers, and even if we include uh, June to date, um, near-term performance has been improving, um, with Harris actually outperforming every, um, each month to date from uh, the end of the quarter. So whistling through on slide 45, there is a breakdown of, it, of the fund's um, performance. You can see the top five stocks are contributed and bottom five, for example. You would note that the top five, as expected, are full of um, healthcare, tech, and uh, a gold, no, healthcare and tech, sorry. And the negatives are more of those cyclical miners and banks and auto companies that sold off. Um, interestingly as well, the underweight, obviously, to oil and gas in this fund um, was one of the sectors that was uh, contributed positively over the, over the quarter. Slide 46 highlights each manager's performance against the benchmark. Um, as you can see, there was that significant quarter drawdown in Harris, uh, where they ended up in the quarter 12% behind. Um, this is due to their high conviction uh, value approach, um, but we do expect them to recover, and we have seen um, green shoots of their recovery and bounce back following that drawdown. Um, there's a slide in the appendix, this presentation that shows how they performed in the last five crises, and they've always uh, outperformed and actually ended up in the upper two quartiles against uh, all global equity managers. So since inception, you can see that um, Schroders have actually um, have performed um, positively. They've con contributed, they've outperformed by 3.4% and Union are uh, uh, marginally ahead as well. So two out of the three managers are positive. Um, that's again reiterated on slide 47 in your pack. Um, I've highlighted on the right the chart of how these managers are performing against their peers. So we can see that the procurement process Colin undertook has delivered two managers that are in the upper two quartiles. Uh, and Harris, um, unfortunately, is in the fourth quartile at the moment due to that poor quarter and the effect that big drawdowns had. However, up to the end of December, they were in the, uh, the upper quartile against their peers. Um, the red line on that chart on the left highlights the performance objective for the um, periods. So you can see over the annual license inception to the end of May that this chart highlights. We do have, as I pointed out, uh, Schroders are ahead of benchmark and target, and Union are just ahead of benchmark. Um, going on to slide 48, as you know, r &E is at the heart of our investment process, so I thought I'd um, provide this slide, and I know you've got further information later, I believe, about your voting engagement, but these are how the three managers in the Global Equity Man um, Fund uh, incorporate ESG into their investment processes. So, for example, Harris, um, they try to price in ES material ESG risks into their intrinsic value approach. Um, that's done by both portfolio managers and analysts. Um, they engage uh, regularly with all, all um, companies within their within their portfolio. Um, Schroders, their Global sector list analysts um, working with their sustainable investment team incorporate ASG scoring and analysis into their valuation models. And then those uh, concerns are considered by the um, 
from portfolio manager when he's selecting the stocks and constructing the portfolio. Union takes a slightly different approach. They have a proprietary ESG scoring um, system, and those ESG scores are populated by the um, ex a separate team, the, in the internal sustainability and engagement team. And these are um, provided to the fund manager to help base his decision of whether to invest or not. And he, those portfolio managers are trained by the in-house ESG team on how to best use those scores. Um, as you can see on the right, all the managers are signed up to the UN PRI goals. Um, they provide our RINE team um, with quarterly questionnaires. That we have quarterly calls um, with their ESG teams and our ESG teams. And um, they all, for example, um, review climate risk as part of their processes as well. So moving on to the actual stewardship, here's some highlights on engagements over the quarter for the fund um, that Central undertook as well. So we can see we know Harris has had 15 engagements over the quarter, the early stages around um, company um, executive level changes, so Credit Suisse had a CEO change, etc. And towards the end of the quarter, it was more about the social aspect and employee welfare around how the companies were dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. And that follows for Schroeder's and Union as well. So there was, Gord, as um, Colin mentioned, this is, the, this is the risk within the fund. This is a style skyline. So for those of you that have never, haven't come across one before, the chart on the left, the, the multicolored chart on the left, shows you the factors to which the fund is biased towards. So if it's above the line, the fund is positively biased towards that factor. So if you look on the left-hand side, the light blue value, you, you can see that the fund is significantly um, weighted towards value and hence why um, the fund struggled in the quarter when value under, uh, underperformed growth. Um, towards the right, you can see that this fund does score positively on environmental and social aspects and has a, a lower carbon footprint than the index. Uh, the right chart on the right shows the contribution to the risk from actual stock picking, style of the managers, sector allocations in the market. And as you can see, the blue section equity is still the biggest contributor to that risk. So we have still, our risk is still with the fund managers and their ability to pick stocks, which is what was desired at the start. So in summary, on the, on the global equity fund, Q1 was disappointing, uh, and it was driven by our value manager. But to put it into context, it was the worst quarter in over a decade for value investing. I think it's actually 13.3 years. More recently, they have started to outperform the rising market. And as you can see, the, uh, the fund is out, has outperformed in May and continues to do so into June. Schroders continues to provide significant excess return and is ahead of performance and um, benchmark. All three managers are following their investment processes. We meet them, we talk to them every month to provide the oversight that the reason that we hired them, they're still, they're still following the reasons that we brought into them and believing that they can generate those returns that we require. Um, we do believe that history will repeat itself and that the value factor will rebound and Harris with their superior stock picking will, will outperform. Um, so that's the Global Equity Fund. Uh, I'm not sure how long I've got, so I can whistle through the emerging. So it's the same same information as Mark, we don't, Mark I's bullish. We don't need to go through every slide. I think some of the members will have read most of these already. Okay. So just, just gloss over where you have to. Okay, so just on um, the first slide then on um, Q1 performance, um, the fund performed well, it's positioned in uh, quality stocks, um, it was driven by Von Zabel, who has a large overweight to China, and, um, and superior stock picking from them. 
So it, 92 basis points our performance in the in in the quarter. Um, again, we'll slide past the attribution then, uh, just to highlight the individual managers again against benchmark. BMO um, has underperformed to the end of May, and, but this is far shorter time. Um, Time period than the global equity. This fund is uh, has its anniversary next month. Um, UBS is ahead of target, uh, mainly because they are they're exposed to mega large, large caps and technology stocks. And Vontabel has uh, performed very strongly due to focus on quality. Um, again, there's the short term um, history. Uh, again. If I want to peruse the ROI and the approaches of all those three managers, I've included those. Um, engagement statistics. And then if we just focus on the risk again, as Colin mentioned, value is uh, we're underweight value in this fund and overweight quality. <coughs> value is um, harder to find within emerging markets, um, more of a growth obviously orientated um, sector um, but interestingly and, and positively we score on social aspects governance and still have that lower carbon footprint um, all the risk metrics are within tolerances so I'll just jump to the summary so it was a poor quarter in markets at the benchmark level but the fund underperformed with one of, else, uh, one of the three managers strong stock picking and, and driven by China which is one of the the markets which surprisingly held up the best globally. BMO still lags. Again, they are significantly underweight China, and UBS is generating returns. Again, through our oversight, all managers are following their investment processes, um, and the fund is underweight to value, but we believe this is generally sensible within emerging markets due to um, kind of the amount of companies that have partial state controls. So a rally rally could potentially hurt performance um, if the market recovers strongly. Okay, thank uh, you very much indeed. Any questions? Um, could I ask, has anybody got um, questions to um, Mark, Colin, or to Bulash? Chair, sure, can I come in? Yeah, please do. Yeah, Mark, uh, your presentation on summary section. Yeah, the, we keep saying that we're investing quite uh, in China, but the recent tension in the global uh, the area of uh, in China, most of the countries are boycotting their goods or about to boycott the goods. How would that affect us? Um, so. In the Global Equity Fund, um, the China positioning isn't significant. Um, I guess it's the knock-on effect to all markets, really, isn't it? I mean, it, if China, China is the the, um, the manufacturer for the world, um, we saw in the in the pandemic how it would affect us in the emerging market fund and and the <coughs> global fund for. Um, it's those global companies that have exposure to China as well, that sell into China. So things like in a global fund, Daimler, which struggled significantly, although they're seeing a recovery now as China opens up. Uh, in the emerging market fund, um, we have one manager who's significantly underweight China and one manager that's overweight, kind of offsetting each other. Um, Can I come so, in there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the, my question is there's a big tension going on as we speak around the China and China borders. I've just heard yesterday most of the European countries are also boycotting the products from China or not, um, uh, uh, utilizing China products. Clearly, that would have an impact on the companies that we may be investing uh, through the China uh, thing. That's the question I'm uh, uh, asking, because if, if not today, yeah. tomorrow, a global market of products of China will be heavily impacted. 
So the fund managers that we the fund managers that we hire um, they have full discretion on the positions that they they you know we we can't impact the positions that they take. They are bottom up stock pickers. So if they saw or felt that risk wasn't worth taking, they would they would exit positions. So recently we've seen a there's a um, Taiwan Semiconductors, a chip manufacturer, and we've seen one of our managers reduce their position there due to um, those concerns around, you know, um, back around Huawei and kind of the banning of, um, of using their, their their systems. So the, the managers are fully aware of those, those risks and are adjusting their positions accordingly. Can Thank I add to that more? The China has moved significantly as a country over over the last five years, but certainly if you go back 15 or 20 years, in that it was originally an export-led economy, completely and utterly export-led. It's now very much focused, and, and its internal policy is to focus on internal uh, metrics. Most of the stocks that the managers hold within the Emerging Markets Fund, and we have next to no exposure to China directly within the Global Equity Fund, Within the Emerging Market Fund, where obviously, where obviously China is a significant element of the index, it's about a third of the index, uh, most of the exposure is local Chinese companies selling local left to China, or more specifically, where it's outside China. The major markets that they have are they, their immediate neighbours, uh, i.e. The, the Pacific area. Uh, so that trade tension between the US and China which may spill over to other countries in China, won't have as big effect on the kind of companies that our managers hold as it will do perhaps to China, to, to other Chinese companies. Most of those will fall into that sort of value type uh, investments which our managers are not heavily involved in. So I, I think the, China, the China, China has moved so significantly uh, that it's not perhaps the big issue from a stock market perspective as we would have thought five years ago. Okay, thank you very much, Colin. Thank you. Um, could thank I uh, then close um, this section uh, and uh, thank our presenters uh, for, uh, for the updates? Um, right, um, I presume then we're just asked to note the, uh, the report, so I take it that members are quite content to do that. But can then move on um, to the um, item nine, which starts on pages of 67 of, your, of, of the report, is the summary valuation of pension fund investments and investment performance of individual managers set out. Uh, and that's for you, Declan. Thank you, Chair. It, this is just the standard quarterly report that just gives us sort of the um, valuation update on the, on the fund itself. Um, I won't go through, there's quite a bit in there on the central front, so obviously I'll try and avoid you know, duplicating what the, the guys have just sort of been through. So the, the first section of the report, the market outlook and performance, um, we very rarely change um, uh, asset allocations just sort of for tactical, tactical reasons. So really this, this is in there just for you to give you sort of a bit of a feel of sort of where sort of different opinions are on kind of the, the markets are, are, are going to be heading just to give you a bit, I suppose, of a, a potential what to expect over the sort of the next quarter, the next kind of year as it were. But it is just, like I say, it's kind of more of a, an indication rather than anything expected to, to do anything with the, at this time. The more interesting table in that was the second one in paragraph four at the moment with all the, the volatility and this is a this is just a um, uh, a historic sort of market wide return rather than the, the fund return I'll come on to that surely but you've seen the three months I mean it's kind of reflecting what you've seen in the in the news up to the end of the March it'll be thin in March there's sort of just complete sort of devastation of kind of equity markets and quite a few of the other kind of key asset classes but the, the comforting thing very much is if you sort of move along the table to that kind of that five year picture you will see that actually kind of the even on the five years after that kind of you know sort of seismic kind of crash actually the returns come back to kind of a you know, not a not a great level, but a sort of a, an okay level, and another sort of a level that's not too far off what the what the fund needs to return to meet its kind of um, valuation report that you sort of saw in the um, over the last sort of few months. So there is there is a bit of comfort in there, and even the one that's still negative, the infrastructure actually for the the LCC fund that's probably 
positive because we've got such a such a global exposure with sort of the, the weakening of sterling as well. That sort of helped it helped on there as well. So that's right. That's such, that first section is really just a bit of a kind of a, a scene setter, and obviously kind of with the the bounce back since March, we'd expect that sort of table next time you see it to, to be a lot better. Moving into moving into the the funds, so the sort of paragraph sort of seven just sort of gives you a very brief summary of the where the fund performance has been for the end of end of March, and and losing 11 percent in the quarter is obviously kind of quite painful, but the. Um, but again, it does sort of flip back a little bit. You'll see over the three-year period, it's only 1.8% 1.8% loss, which is kind of a oh, sorry 1.8% gain over that sort of three-year period. So you can see that it's kind of it hasn't been sort of a seismic impact on the on the fund, although it's kind of it is is behind where we'd ideally like to like to be. And obviously that comes from the the positivities of the diversification of the fund. So you don't get the full impact of the equity performance. You know, the flip side is we don't obviously get the the full gains. But on a you know on a sort of a, a long term sort of pension fund like ourselves, and we don't want to be exposing the sort of the various employers to to an excessive amount of risk. So the, you can see the benefit of diversification coming in in there. And like I say, we, we do know a lot of those losses have been been recovered. Um, paragraph nine in the report then just picks up how the sort of the allocation of the assets is sort of varies. So this isn't about performance; it's just about where the money is. The um, you can see from the, the turmoil that it kind of it hasn't had a sort of a it hasn't really knocked us out of shape too badly, and that's because you know as Elgin touched on, it's kind of been kind of a, quite a broad based sort of impact up to the end of the quarter. Um, slightly odd presentation at the moment. We sort of split it between old and new benchmarks. So the old one obviously being sort of what we were reporting against last year, and the new one being sort of what we where we're setting ourselves up for from January. And obviously, it takes a bit of time to to get some of those um, changes in place to sort of reallocate realigned to the, the benchmarks. Just as a kind of a, a bit of a reminder, the main ones are um, on equities, actually, and this is within equities, so it doesn't affect that table, the, the move from some of the passives in Elgin towards Central's climate-based fund, um, and that will sort of completely contained within in equities. We're also, um, in the plan, we were reducing index-linked um, funds into corporate bonds, and, you know, I've touched on that in that previous paper that has largely been done. So that will um, rectify some of those over and away. So in the final one, we were going to disinvest from rough and move into the multi-asset credit that sort of Bulash touched on in the, in the central sort of um, update paper. And um, the multi-asset credit, that's is an interesting one that Elgin pulled that out as an area they thought that kind of funds should be investing in. And the, that, this sort of MAC fund, as they're often called, does sort of allow a manager to invest across a full spectrum of asset classes within credit, and high yield is obviously kind of a key part of that, and that's one of the ones that the um, LGM did pull out. Moving down to, to paragraph sort of 14, another table in there just gives the, the performance of the fund itself versus the sort of the global or sort of the, the market benchmarks, so sort of wider sort of indices. You'll see on you know on the, on the equities we've, we've fallen short of the, of the benchmark, and the, and the reason for that is the is the currency hedge. As sterling is sterling weakened, um, we've, we had a 50% hedge against sort of most of the sort of the US kind of. Um, Assets and unfortunately, that doesn't mean that we sort of lose money on the currency hedge. You know, the flip side around is that the hedge is in there for for risk management. It means that we never sort of lose as badly the, the flip way around. But that's why our equities broadly is below the benchmark. But obviously, you've heard from LGPS Central and their product is is lagging a bit as well. So that's not that's not helped the cause in there. Private equity is a big health warning on this one. The problem with private equity is because it's not a liquid market, they tend to be a much, much slower at revaluing their assets. And you know, there's no way they've sort of beaten the benchmark by that much. The, the truth is what we'll see is kind of a bit of a lag on private equity where they kind of, you know, as the rest of the markets are coming back up, they're probably still going to be going down a little bit. You know, and there's, there's nothing to suggest that private equity won't sort of get hit in the same way. So we do expect that to kind of uh, that to change. The real income assets, you know, property infrastructure, things like that, held up pretty well. We're a little bit ahead of ahead of benchmarking there, but you know, nothing to sort of shout up too much about. Um, you know, obviously this is one of the diversifying assets where you know they've not dropped as much on the either the fund or the benchmark level as sort of the equity side of things. So that's the thing, one of the things that helps us as keep hold of our assets in the kind of the um, the dark times, as it were. And the alternatives is a bit of a funny. It's actually kind of a bit of a kind of a. In some ways, it is a good news story, or it's a mixed story. Actually, there's some good news in there as well as some bad. The the emerging market debt again. It's one of those that um, Elgin touched on. I think the phrase he used was it had been beaten up a bit, and it's kind of I, I, I don't know. Emerging markets probably 
a little bit more than beaten up on the on the deck. We really did lose heavily on that area. But you know, the truth is, it's it was it is one of the areas we invest in to add a bit of sort of spice to the funds, it were to hope that we kind of get better than sort of I suppose average returns in the in the long term. But you know, when it's volatile like this, particularly where it's sort of a global crisis, emerging markets do get hit heavily, and unfortunately, the uh, um, the the countries that our manager had picked to pick to back had got hit even worse than kind of the um, the global average as it were. So it's that that country selection did work against us. The upside and the alternative is the target return sort of um, uh, basket of kind of three managers, and it's been one that's kind of very, we've been concerned as a sort of committee over the last few years that it's lagged its performance targets. But it, it's kind of come to the fore a bit. Aspect have done very well. You know, it's a momentum manager, but. Even then, they've managed to kind of um, stay in line with the the target, which is cash plus four percent. So it's tough to kind of keep keep that absolute return in a kind of a, a declining market. But Aspect did well. You know, they they got the ability to be very very volatile, but they came good in in this quarter. Ruffer as well. You know, we've we've had a lot of frustration with Ruffer, but finally their ship has has come in. You know, they kind of the um, they've been. They've been waiting for something like this to happen for a long, long time, and now the sort of the bets they've placed did pay off. Unfortunately, the, the length of time we have to wait for Ruffer's bets to come in is probably is is too long. It still feels a, the right decision to disinvest from them when we when we do have a, a product with central to sort of move into. And pick say the final match. It was the the disappointing one of the three, but to be honest, you you're always going to get a bit of that where kind of not all managers can excel at the same time. And they, they just couldn't diversify fully away from equities. They've, they've kind of done better than a pure equity play, but, you know, they've still got quite a big equity exposure in there. Um, I wasn't going to go through all the details of text. I've picked off some of the main bits, but the, um, like I say, Central have covered a lot of the, a lot of the stuff, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Declan. Has anybody got questions for Declan? No, Jeff. Okay, uh, that's fine then. Um, Could I ask members um, the Jeff intent to uh, note the report from Declan? Yes, yes no, Jeff. Yes, Jeff. Okay, um, with. Okay, um, we're moving then on to agenda item 10. Uh, which starts at uh, pages 107, uh, and that's on responsible investment update. Is that too bullish? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, just before we start, it's probably worth noting that there is an invite gone out. I think Kat sent it yesterday. Um, it's for the 3rd of July. It's a, uh, a virtual RI day that Central are hosting. It's split over two sessions, so if you can't make one, you might be able to make the other. And uh, They're on the 3rd of July, like I say. They're about an hour and 50 each. Um, I thought it'd be worth noting that now. On to the main report. Um, the purpose is to present a update on the 2020 plan that we brought to committee uh, earlier this year. Um, we've got two appendices, the first of which is a quarterly voting report for the first time. And the second is uh, the quarterly stewardship report, which um, is the second time we brought it. You may remember Val from Central presented it last time out. A uh, bit of background. Um, we brought to committee in January our first RI plan. Um, it's developed with LGPS Central's in-house RI team. Um, it's worth noting, and it's stated within our investment strategy statement, um, our goal is to engage companies um, rather than divest holdings. Um, and again, it's in line with what you've heard from LGM and what you've heard from Central again today. Uh, moving on to point eight and point nine. Um, the report, the voting report, covers the period from January to March, so just the first quarter. Um, and it, it, it holds details on voting on our LGM passives as well as our two equity holdings with Central, so that's the uh, Global Emerging Markets and the Global Active Equity Fund. Uh, together, it's about 40% of all our fund's assets. Um, going forward, we'll try and incorporate more. We do have equity holdings within PICTE, uh, our target return manager, and obviously Ruffer as well. Um, so we can pick up some more of those. Um, some details regarding the votes. Um, the fund made voting recommendations at 700 or so company meetings in the quarter, and at 300, or about half, um, 
the fund and its managers uh, recommended opposing one or more of the resolutions. Um, the appendix will break down that further. It, it splits it by um, geography and, and types of uh, votes that we uh, opposed. Uh, within these company meetings, uh, there was circa uh, 3,400 separate resolutions that were abstained or voted against. Uh, the majority of these were board structure related, so about half of those that we didn't vote with management for um, were, were regarding board structure. And there was another 16% which was related to remuneration, so that could be things such as uh, ex uh, excessive pay for executives, for example. Uh, number 14 is the quarterly stakeholder report. Um, the, the report that's in Appendix B holds quite a lot of really good information. Uh, I pulled out a couple of bits in here that, that would probably help. So point 15 on the report um, shows that it's continuing our focus on the four <coughs> stewardship themes. So that's uh, climate change one, single-use plastics two, fair tax and tax transparency three, and then technology and destructive industry. So they're the, they're the themes that we're looking to um, progress this year, and uh, we're looking to keep the same themes for 2021 also. Um, Claire's report earlier mirrored some of the similar themes as well, so it's, it's good to see that across the investment landscape we're, we're all looking at the same kind of things. Um, point 15 is an example of where uh, positive engagement has, has you know, given us the right um, outcome. Uh, Along with 10 other investors, uh, LGPS Central co-filed resolutions with Barclays to disclose targets to phase out finance to companies that aren't aligned with the Paris climate change goals. Um, following various meetings, etc., Barclays have announced their ambition to become a net zero bank, covering all emissions in their own operations and that of their clients. Uh, the next page, point 17, is a reminder of our 2020 plan. So you can see that in the table, and we've also got um, some some status updates along the side there. Um, it's worth noting that in, in the next quarter, we were due to receive a climate risk report from Central. That may be delayed. We are in the second tranche for, um, for you know getting that report to us, and the first tranche hasn't yet completed. So if, if they're delayed, it's likely that we'll be delayed also. So um, I'll bring that back with a, an update at the next meeting. Any questions? Are there any no. questions to Bullish? No. No. Okay, again, um, could I ask members um, that uh, you note uh, the presentation and the report? Agreed. Happy to Agreed. 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 Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Um, moving on then to agenda item 11, the risk register and internal controls. Um, the presentation will be done by Chris. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is the, the usual risk management update. Um, I think obviously, the, the, the key thing that's happened since the previous one has been the, the, the um, impact of coronavirus, and the risks are going to be updated to reflect that. Uh, and I'd point members to paragraph four, which kind of sets out some of the, the, the key changes. And, and the impact of coronavirus has been kind of wide ranging kind of from, from, from administration, for example, the ability of organizations to provide year end information so that we can actually produce annual government statements. So the financial resilience of employers um, and, and it also including kind of risk 10 in terms of investment performance. It, risk management is, is something we do take, kind of take very, very, very seriously, and uh, and I think as the, the the crisis kind of moves from one that's been more kind of health focused to, to really one that's going to be more of an economic one, it is something that we will we will be kind of monitoring kind of very care, carefully because I say the impact is is very wide ranging, and I think will kind of change over time. So I'm, I'm happy to take any questions in terms of the detail of the report. Again, members, has anybody got a question on the? Uh, risk register. Um, no, Chair. No. Okay. Could no. I then ask you again um, to approve the revised risk register of the pension fund? And I take it, unless somebody uh, objects, I take it that's agreed. Approved. Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Right. The um, last um, presentation again from 
uh, Chris, will be the report of the LGPS Central uh, Company Matters. Thank you, Peter. Um, Peter, this, this is an update on, on various LGPS Company Matters um, in terms of those, those relating to LGPS Central. I'm going to skip over the backgrounds. I think members will be, be familiar with the governance of LGPS Central. So I'll start by kind of talking a little bit around the, the Joint Committee meeting, so paragraph kind of eight, eight onwards. The, the, the Joint Committee meeting is, is the meeting where the focus is, is really on investor issues, so really more of Leicestershire County Council as a, as, a, as a client of LGPS Central rather than an, an owner. The, the report kind of sets out the, 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 the things that were discussed at that meeting. But the one thing it doesn't really pull out, I suppose, is, is, is the point that Peter made in terms of the progress we made in terms of pooling, which, which is clearly um, slower than the original business plan. And, and Peter did make that point at the meeting and, and, and kind of made it, made it well. So uh, again, I think we, we have kind of registered that we do think that, that possibly progress could, could be quickened. Clearly, we've talked about this in the past, and some of the reasons for, for, for the slow progress are, are kind of, kind of wide-ranging. The, the second kind of issue I'll pick up in terms of the company is around the, the, the company meeting and the budget. Uh, unfortunately, the, the company meeting was a kind of casualty of the of, the, of, of coronavirus and was, and was cancelled. You can kind of see some paragraph kind of 17 onwards the various things that have kind of take, taken place in terms of getting some of the resolutions kind of sorted, kind of following the meeting, so they, they've kind of been agreed kind of remotely. The, the one thing that, that, that has only just been agreed is, is actually the budget for LGPS Central for the current year. So there's been a kind of series of kind of emails and conversations with, um, with the company over the last kind of two or three months, and we've now got a position where we've, we've uh, agreed the budget. Mark Wynn, who's my counterpart, Part, uh, Cheshire, Cheshire West has kind of led those and has done a very good job. So we are in a position of, of, of agreeing, agreeing the budget and a set of principles. And members will, will know that since we set up LGPS Central, the budget has been a bit of an issue each, each and every year. I'm quite hopeful that things have moved on a bit, and, and hopefully when we get into kind of next year's budget setting process, it should be, it should be a lot smoother. Again, happy to answer any questions on any of that. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I take it that, uh, because nobody's indicated, um, that you're content to uh, note uh, the presentation from Chris. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, then on to agenda item 13, the, just to say the next meeting of the committee is scheduled to take place on Friday the 11th of September at 9.30. Agreed. Okay. Um, yeah. And then formally, it says, I must uh, move that the public be excluded from the meeting for the remainder of the items of the agenda in accordance with Section 100 of the Local Government Act, as they contain exempt information. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Uh, if you just hold with us um, whilst... Um, the live stream is taken offline. It'll just take a few moments. Okay, that's uh, then been done. Um, I propose that we take the remaining quarterly reports as noted so I can bring this uh, meeting to a close. Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, could I, in closing, thank um, everybody concerned um, for the manner in which they've, uh, their patience and the way that they've uh, uh, done the